Hello and welcome to the virtual launch of the Center for the Shoring Autonomy. I'm delighted that so many of you have decided to join the team to learn more about the center and our ambitions. And uh, today we'll have short, four short talks, starting with Chris White, Head of Program Delivery at Lloyd's Register Foundation, uh, who've been major supporters of our work for the past few years. Next, we'll go to John McDermott, the center director. And uh, then you'll hear from me again. I'm Anna McIntosh, the, the Director for Strategic Programs, before we move on to Ibrahim Habley, the Centre's Research Director. If you've got questions, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of this screen. Uh, we'll do our best to address these either at the end or in a follow-up. Um, and if you need to read some captions, there's also a button for that. We've enabled captions. So now I'd like to start by handing over to Chris White from Lloyd's Register Foundation. Chris. So I'm going to give uh, a short introduction to the Lloyd Register Foundation and talk about our work with uh, the University of York. So as Anna said, I'm Chris White. I'm Head of Programme Delivery. Uh, I joined the foundation in 2019, so a little bit after the award of the uh, Assuring Autonomy International Programme, um, which was the first phase of the, the work that we did with the University of York. So a little bit about Lloyd Register Foundation. Uh, we're an independent global foundation, um, a charity with a unique structure and an important mission. Um, to engineer a safer world. And you'll see here are charitable objectives, which essentially say we reduce risk and enhance the safety of critical infrastructure that modern society relies upon, such as en energy, transport and food. And we do this by supporting high quality research, accelerating technology to application and through education and public outreach. And you'll see a, a little uh, infographic at the bottom there that shows we've got about 140 million pounds worth of grants around the world those are active in about 142 countries. Um, and we've had about 300, nearly 400 grants over the time we've been active, which is uh, coming up for just over 10 years now. So our history with the, um, with the University of York started in 2018. Uh, we initially established the Assuring Autonomy International Program, um, which was a five-year award um, and a 12 million pound investment between both the University of York and the Lloyd Register Foundation. And this followed a foresight review of robotics and autonomous systems that was released in 2016, and I think still has quite a lot of um, reasonable uh, uh, information still in it. And you can find that on our website. And that identified that one of the biggest uh, issues was, um, biggest obstacles was to gain the benefit of, of robotics and autonomous systems was to really assure the, uh, assure them and regulate and understand how that regulation and assurance works. So that would then potentially open up new markets. And in, like I said, in 2018, we started the, the, co the collaboration with the University of York. And in five years, the, the fantastic work that's happened there has led to really influential research. And the guidance has been translated into um, you know, multiple instances. And there's some really fantastic uh, models that have come out, which are, you know, really scaling up and and working across the globe and referenced in new new standards. And beyond that, there's been a huge amount of additional input. We've seen the the opening of the um, Institute for Safe Autonomy. We've seen additional money flowing in for training. So there's a, a huge amount that um, our partnership with the University of York has has driven. And I I really see the team at York and the university as a major partner of the foundation. And I, I'm absolutely thrilled to, to introduce um, and introduce the foundation and, and have this initial presentation. So I'm gonna hand over to John now and stop sharing, um, but thank you very much for, for joining and thank you to the team. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, very nice to be able to speak to you today and, and, and thank you Chris, for that um, uh, kind in introduction. I mean, the, the, the support from the foundation has been uh, absolutely crucial to us addressing the central problems in the assurance and uh, regulation uh, of autonomous systems. After the six years of uh, the Assuring Autonomy International Programme, we're pleased to launch this new centre. And, and for us, um, there are a number of really important um, differences here, although the, the, the foundation has provided us with four million pounds to the new centre. We've already got gearing on that to raise it to around um, 10 million pounds. Um, rather than um, continuing um, our research, which we will do, 
um, alone. We've also now increased the focus on um, innovation and transfer of the ideas on safe autonomy, safety of AI and ML um, into um, industry and with, with regulators. What we've done in the Assuring Autonomy program is worked across about um, a dozen sectors and we continue to work across sectors because we see lots of the ideas, lots of the challenges of being the same across the industrial sectors. There are detailed differences, but the fundamental principles and fundamental approaches are, are the same. One of the things we're actually able to do based in university is work both with industry and with regulators to allow them to um, collaborate on, on problems in what's very much a, a neutral ground away from regulation of a particular system. Um, one of the great things we're able to do because of the foundation's support is to put the, the guidance that we develop into the public domain to make it freely available for uptake. Now we also provide support for people um, using the guidance we've produced. Um, so actually, in terms of the, the heritage of our, our work in York, we've you know worked with industry and, and regulators on standards and guidance over um, several decades, approaching 40 years now. Part of the gearing we're able to get on the initial funding from the foundation enables us to, to build a, a very large scale um, facility, which is a living lab that enables us to do experimentation and testing on autonomous and robotic systems that we couldn't do before. I think again, one of our unusual strengths for an academic research center is that many of our staff have worked in industry uh, for consultancies for companies like um, BA Systems in the nuclear sector, in, in rail and so on. And so have a, a, a lot of practical real world experience um, to bring to our activities, um, not just academic research. So already mentioned, we set up for working um, across sectors and we're able to build on this really strong legacy for ensuring autonomy international program let me just say a little bit about what that um, looks like and, and how that's had an, an impact so we've written um, guidance on how you assure the safety of um, autonomous systems operating in complex environments and on the machine learning components within those autonomous um, systems and these are as far as we know the first systematic approaches to evaluating that sort of technology in these class of systems the picture in the bottom shows um amlas um, our guidance for machine learning um components that's been downloaded and used a lot but also we have carried out you know the normal academic work of producing um published papers there's you know nearly 180 peer-reviewed papers out there getting over more than 2,000 citations done by ourselves, but also more importantly, um, done with our um, research um, partners and industrial collaborators. Um, we've also been working on um, standards and education and, and training. For example, we influenced one of the, the key um, standards produced by the BSI for AI in, in healthcare, BS 3440. We've been training um, a lot of people um, on our, our guidance, particularly for, for machine learning, and don't count them, but this is roughly 500 people, um, but that's going to grow uh, and, and be more. Uh, but to us, actually, this is one of the key ways of getting um, across the work and getting impact is through this education and training um, program. Um, but as well as people we can uh, contact directly, we've had a very large number of downloads of our guidance. Um, 29 countries, we've actually interacted directly with people um, in 16 countries um, uh, across most of the continents. We haven't yet managed um, Africa and Antarctica, um, but hopefully that will um, come in time. And as already been said by Chris, we've got very substantial gearing in investment um, on, on top of the funds from the foundation, which has really enabled us to make a difference. So what about um, the, the future um, in our um, new centre? Well, it's still quite a substantial um, activities and 25 academic staff and, and research staff um, and a large number of PhD students. We're still focusing on both the industry and regulator perspective. And again, I think that's one of the, the unique strengths of, of what we do. We're going to build on what we've um, 
already done the existing approaches around uh, machine learning and about autonomous systems but we're looking at new areas as these systems begin to be deployed we need to understand how to manage them safely in practice so we're doing work on safety management systems for autonomy and ml and also looking at um, evaluation of, of operation centers We've done that in um, air traffic management, hope to do so in, in maritime before very long. I think one of the great strengths of what we've done, as I've already said, is to work across multiple domains. About a dozen in the six years of the Assuring Autonomy International program, but our aim over the next few years to have greater innovation and greater impact is to focus on a smaller number um, maritime that really relates to the Lloyd's Register heritage, other areas of transport and health where we already have um, very strong links. So at this point, I, I'd like to hand over um, to Anna McIntosh, my colleague, Director of Strategic Programs for the Centre, but also more broadly um, in York to um, tell you about why here and now. So the University of York is uh, 60 years old um, and was built with the founding principles of excellence, equality and opportunity for all, opening its doors to about 230 students with just 28 staff 60 years ago. Uh, since then, the university has grown, joining the prestigious Russell Group of research intensive British universities in 2012. And it's now home to 20,000 students and 5,000 staff. Um, and now, not too far from where we started, we define ourselves as being a university for public good. Despite all of that growth, York remains small enough to be flexible and innovative, but large enough to take some of the risks that we now see coming through. That includes supporting important work before it comes to national attention. Safe autonomy has been a strategic priority area in York for several years, um, and we've laid some important foundations that John's mentioned to you already. In 2023, when the UK government hosted the first global AI safety summit, York's contribution was based on identifying workable solutions to some of the challenges that were raised, not simply identifying more problems. And that's our trademark. We know that autonomous systems and AI are being adopted by companies across the globe um, and that many of them already have real concerns about their, their deployment, while others are worrying about their ongoing operations. We know that it's time to take AI safety seriously, uh, and at the Centre for Showing Autonomy, we already do, and we will continue to do so. We've assembled a specialist team uh, with input from our partners to shape it, um, and we've made sure that our research can be applied to real problems and doesn't just exist in a vacuum. Our colleagues in the team have that wealth of experience that John was talking about in academia and industry, and they continue to work on both the underpinning research challenges and the more applied research too. Uh, and that's a real strength. We have uh, an idea about the kind of organisations we want to partner with. Lloyd's Register Foundation is a great example of the kinds of partnerships we, we like to develop because it's uh, organisations that care about safety and have the same kind of values as we do. But we're also interested in others, whether they be companies or regulators who want to educate themselves ahead of the curve uh, and make sure that they're serving their stakeholders properly. Um, we want to work with people who value autonomy not only for the profits or the cost-saving measures that they can bring, uh, but also for the benefits that they can bring to society. We want to work with researchers who know that safety starts at the, right at the beginning. It's not simply an add-on, uh, and it's not simply something that can be done after the technology has been developed. Uh, and they're really the principles for, for who we're looking to work with in the future. But... Organisations who work with us also have access to a wealth of other initiatives which are going on at the University of York, um, starting with the uh, UKRI AI Centre for Doctoral Training on Lifelong Safety Assurance of AI-Enabled Autonomous Systems, that's SAINTS for short. Um, we'll be starting to train our PhD students from September 2024, five cohorts totalling 60 PhD students focusing specifically on safe AI. On top of that, uh, Chris mentioned the Institute for Safe Autonomy, which was launched just recently um, and which is home to 100 or more researchers. Uh, it's made up of bespoke living labs with space for partners to come and see us. On top of that, we work on a, a number of initiatives which are funded by large philanthropic gifts, which have a real life changing impact uh, on top of the major research programmes, which are our normal work. 
Our future collaboration really is around all of those things. Um, we'd like to hear from you if you're interested in working with us, whether that be from academia, from industry, from policy, uh, anywhere, uh, and that includes globally. And we're interested in making sure that the work that we do here in York has a global impact uh, and can be adopted anywhere uh, so that we have access to, to our work for all. Uh, I'll hand over now to Ibrahim, he'll tell you a little bit more about the research that we're going to be doing as part of the Centre for Assuring Autonomy. Uh, my name is Ibrahim Habli, I'm the research director of the centre, and it is a pleasure to present to you the research within our new centre. So as we all know, safety is inherently multidisciplinary and collaborative. It's not a solo adventure or a, a technical property that we try to prove, but something that cuts across the whole life cycles of systems from concept all the way to deployment and decommissioning with many complex technical, social, ethical, and legal considerations that have to be taken into account through life. And this collaborative and multidisciplinary nature of safety is important for all complex systems, but is even more important when those systems incorporate novel and new technologies like AI and autonomous systems, especially when deployed within open and adaptive environments like in transport or healthcare. And this whole systems approach underpins our school of thought here in New York and has been at the heart of our work in, on safe autonomy for the last six years and even longer. So I have to give you one, uh, one thing we're proud of, which is that over 20 years ago, we published our first paper on safety of neural networks within aerospace. And this is 20 years ago, during the dark stages of ages of AI, even then we were thinking about the potential for those technologies to be used for the benefit of society, especially in safety critical applications. So let me, before telling you about what we're doing at the moment, let me briefly tell you about what we've been up to for the last six years and how we are building on our research in this field. So up to the end of last year, we clustered our research around five research blocks, around, again, corresponding to this whole systems approach to safety. Let's start off with our first block called AMLAS, which relates to the assurance of machine learning within safety critical autonomous applications. Uh, and AMLAS is our work on providing and developing a safety case for the machine learning components as part of a wider safety case. And why did we choose machine learning to focus on? The reason was that machine learning is a key technology which enables two other critical functions in autonomous systems, which are understanding and decision making. And that takes us to the two other, two other blocks within our research uh, landscape which is source and SADA, which correspond to safety of understanding as well as safety of decision-making. And going up in the levels of abstraction, these form key parts of a wider research block called SACE, which stands for Safety Assurance of Autonomous Systems in Complex Environments, which takes this whole systems engineering approach to safety of autonomous and AI-enabled systems. But as you know, when we deploy autonomy and AI systems in complex environments, this result in key societal, ethical, and legal questions that we have to address from the start of the journey rather than just before we deploy. And that's why we have SOCA, which stands for Societal Acceptability of uh, Autonomous Systems. And there we consider these social, ethical, and legal questions and more, which we use to drive and inform the whole engineering life cycle. So it's not a separate thing, but integrated into the engineering of those systems. Importantly, so as, as a leading computer science and engineering university, we did the proper science. We will be published in leading journals like Safety Science, Reliability Engineering, and System Safety, AI Journal, as well as Nature Machine Intelligence. But importantly for us and for our center is that we translated all of this good science into practical and accessible guidelines supported by industrial case studies and evidence, which resulted in three key deliverables out of, of, out of our work on safety of complex systems, inc incorporating autonomy, societal acceptability of those systems through considering ethics assurance, and 
our uh, our AMLAS guidance on how to develop machine learning safety cases when that technology is part of autonomy. So we're very proud of these deliverables and the impact they have made on industrial practices, standardizations, as well as continuous professional development activities. So here you see the relationship between our research, the evaluation of the research, and trans translational activities leading to impact. And we don't draw artificial boundaries between those activities. So what about the future? We want to sustain our work uh, across those five blocks, but give more priority to the next generation of challenges, which center on what happens next after we deploy those systems. And as you know, those systems are already in deployment in a number of applications or in pilots in others. And therefore, we need we would like to move our focus to what we call post-deployment assurance, which is maintaining the safety of those systems as the world around them changed and as the technologies themselves evolve, either through uh, retraining machine learning models or the use of some exciting technologies like continual learning. But again, that, that brings us back to the whole systems approach to safety, that safety isn't an activity, but a through life journey and exercise. So that's the first key priority. The second priority is what we call human-centric autonomy, which um, where we are interested in how autonomous systems and AI augment human capability. And importantly, we're interested in the dialogue between autonomous systems and the different stakeholders, and including users and operators, and how, in particular, AI-based capabilities provide explanations to, to describe why they made certain decisions. And from our point of view, we're interested in particular in meaningful explanations, explanations which are meaningful for the intended audiences, like clinicians or pilots, and not just meaningful for the developers behind those technologies. And these two priorities fall under the umbrella of informed governance, where we want to continue to promote issues around open and learning cultures, especially for sectors where safety practices are still in early stages of maturity. So what about our approach and, and values? Uh, as I already described, safety is inherently collaborative and cross-disciplinary. That's how we do things in York, not just for safety, but across the university. So we treat these as assets rather than a challenge to, to overcome when it comes to working across disciplines. And given the, the, the nature of and the, the challenge and the scale of it, we work in teams, and these are dynamic teams where we cluster, in many cases, organically, people from different disciplines and from different projects to address particular grand challenges, such as safety of human AI teaming in a particular application like uh, air traffic services. And because we work in teams, we try to, we, uh, we are inclusive in how we build, build, build those teams in terms of having different disciplines, people from different backgrounds, but also people from different sages in their careers. So senior researchers could start train junior researchers and continue to promote the culture of, uh, uh, I've just mentioned. And finally, Anna already mentioned our uh, center for doctoral training, SAINS. And SAINS is an old, SAINS and the Center for Assuring Autonomy will work in an integrated manner because our the challenges we are uh, committed to, to, to addressing human AI teaming and through life safety are, are the same. And therefore, the different researchers will be working closely with the doctoral researchers and the wider science network, which includes 34 partners, to continue advancing our work on uh, safe autonomy and safe AI. Thank you very much for joining us to launch the Centre for Assuring Autonomy. And we're looking forward to continuing to make advances in this critical area and to engaging with many of you who are in the audience, whether that's through a research partnership, hosting you as a PhD student, providing continuing professional development to your team, or welcoming you to York as a visiting fellow. I haven't seen any questions drop into the chat just yet. So I thought, John, perhaps you could say something about the activities we've recently started in the maritime sector, while we give people a little bit of time to think uh, whether they have any difficult questions for us. Okay, th thanks, Anna. Um, yes, very happy to to do that. So there's actually, you know, two I think really important things being um, 
happening um, actually in the, the the last week, so early uh, early early March twenty twenty four. Um, some of our colleagues have been out in uh, Japan talking to um, people there who've done actually some of the early successful trials of um, maritime autonomous vessels, and we've been. Um, out there with uh, colleagues from Lloyd's Register, from the NPL, some other um, UK academics as well, looking at ways that we can actually work with the Japanese, helping them on the um, assurance of um, maritime autonomous uh, vessels operating in Japanese uh, coastal waters. Um, at the same time, we, we ran a, a workshop for a very large number of um, stakeholders in the maritime sector from shipbuilders, equipment, uh, suppliers, regulators, uh, ports, um, ships, pilots, and, and so on, to look at the, the challenges around uh, assurance of autonomy um, in, in the maritime sector, including remote operating centers, as well as vessels themselves, and looking at ways that we could actually work together collaboratively on, on that. Um, very positive um, interaction. And, and one of the, the delegates um, said that it was actually the most um, valuable, but also best balanced activity that he'd been in, because it drew together this wide range of, of stakeholders, um, you know, which he hadn't been able to, um, you know, deal with all in one place um, uh, at one time before. So I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic that's got us off to a very good start for the center you know in, in working in in maritime which you know i see as being an increasingly important sector when we set up the assuring autonomy program uh, just over six years ago i'd wanted to focus on maritime and was advised by the foundation not to i think that was good advice i think the industry wasn't ready the last two years that's now really changed and i see that as being um, a, a really important um, area in which to focus over the next few years Thanks. Thank you, John. Um, we have a, a question from a member of the audience who's asked whether um, the Centre for Autonomous, uh, sorry, Centre for Assuring Autonomy's work around healthcare uh, is likely to complement rather than replace healthcare professionals, um, and also whether there was anything in particular that um, we felt there were we could be doing to prepare and train the NHS workforce. Um, perhaps, Ibrahim, I could turn to you and, and ask you to say a little bit about what work we've done with the NHS so far uh, and how that, that fits in with this question. So where we stand at the moment when it comes to autonomous systems is that we see these technologies, especially those incorporating AI, as augmenting and supporting the capabilities of clinicians. That, that, that's why we're moving now from too much emphasis on machine autonomy to more emphasis on human AI or human robot interactions. Um, so, and, and, and how both can, can develop a, a joint cognitive system. And when we talk about safety, we talk about the safety of the composition rather than the safety of the system in isolation. And to do this effectively, we work very closely with NHS as well as with, with various regulators on understanding not just how the technology is developed and could be deployed, but the pathways within which uh, those pathways are, are deployed, the constraints, and also the clinical needs for those technologies. And, and we're very proud of this close relationship, including some of the, our researchers and PhD students being, being clinicians themselves. So this is an ongoing uh, area of research, and we are already uh, running uh, a joint uh, a joint series of uh, CPD activities with NHS England, which is unfortunately oversubscribed, on training clinical safety officers on how to assure the safety of AI within the NHS and within health case generally. And this builds on our work on AMLAS and other guidelines. So the work is ongoing. And, and when we use the term autonomy in particular, in many cases in healthcare, we mean autonomous systems which are going to work with, alongside clinicians uh, in a way that could empower clinicians to serve uh, um, patients and the NHS, but also without undermining their clinical autonomy and, 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 um, uh, and, and any, any other implications to do with liability as well. Thanks, Ibrahim. 
So we've had a couple of questions which relate now to uh, autonomy uh, in the automotive sector. Uh, John, I'm going to turn to you to ask you if you could comment on some of the work that we've done so far in this area um, and whether we've got some work planned also. Um, and specifically touching on whether there's anything that you see in terms of the collaboration between the technology developers and, and the regulators, perhaps, uh, as well. Uh, yeah, th thanks, Hannah. So, I mean, there's a few things that we've um, done that I, I think have, uh, have been shaping some of the approaches to regulation in the autonomous um, sector. Um, we carried out some work with a number of organizations, including Hariba Myra, um, recommending approaches to regulating uh, autonomous vehicles, work with the Law Commission in, in their study. I think that's both shaped um, what's gone into the um, AV bill um, that's before Parliament now, but also some of the thinking around um, uh, um, underpinning um, regulations or second layer of, uh, of regulations that, that would be there. Um, <clears throat> at a more technical level, we've been working with some of the um, uh, autonomous vehicle developers around a number of, of technical issues, you know, for example, um, how you assure uh, perception systems under um, adverse weather and environmental conditions. And that's something that I would e expect to, um, to to carry on doing. And I think, I think one of the, the big things probably in the near future is actually how we make transition to monitoring and managing these systems as the as they enter service um you know there's no such thing as as perfect technology these things won't be perfect on day one so i think a critical thing is actually how we learn from how they um behave in service and actually get feedback um from that in order to um improve the systems and amongst other things i think that needs to be collaborative. There's some things, of course, that the companies will want to keep as their private IP, but I think there'll also be areas where they need to share and to collaborate on information so they can raise the standard across the whole industry. And I think that's an area where we can act as, as sort of neutral brokers across the industry and, and help to achieve that. Thanks. Thanks, John, that's great. Um, we've had a, a question in uh, asking about specific mechanisms for industry to work with the Centre for Assuring Autonomy, um, and, and I'd like to address that one uh, directly. There are a few different ways that uh, the University of York and the Centre for Assuring Autonomy specifically works with, uh, with our partners, uh, and the first one is around research collaborations. <clears throat> Often that research is funded by third parties, whether that be funding councils or, uh, or others, uh, where we can jointly address uh, research problems which are are um, perhaps at the earlier level of the research itself. The second part is what I would call sponsored research, where our partners, our industrial partners especially, tend to directly fund us uh, to do some research which is targeted at a challenge that they've identified. Uh, and somewhere in between is a hybrid that we know as the Knowledge Transfer Partnership. Uh, that's a UK only uh, initiative uh, where companies can uh, work with uh, their university partners and really embed someone within their company, but work with us at the Centre for Assuring Autonomy to, to develop um, some practical solutions. Uh, another angle is often consultancy, so we do some consultancy for uh, organisations, um, but there we're quite careful to tread uh, a fine line whereby the consultancy that the Centre for Assuring Autonomy does uh, is around challenges which are uh, non standard for consultancy companies. If another consultancy company can do the work, then generally it's not the area that we will be focusing on. We're more interested in something which is um, slightly more cutting edge or slightly more tricky to handle than a, a standard consultancy can, can deal with. Um, Another angle might be a fellowship. So we will be launching a fellowship scheme uh, a little bit later on in the year. Um, we're specifically targeting our regulatory uh, and policy uh, partners to come and spend time with us, uh, although there may be space also for industry partners to come and spend time here in York uh, and work with us on, on particular problems that they're having. Uh, and I guess the last part is being our ambassadors. Um, so our partners who've worked with us so far uh, are very keen to to, to flout the fact that they're working with us. Um, they see it as a, a sort of badge of quality of the work that they're doing. Uh, and so if that's something that's also of interest to you uh, in terms of the research partnership, then then we're always open to, to discussing that. Um, 
there's a, a further question which has come in, which is around how the centre uh, may be working to influence and inform the changes which are coming. I, I guess that's in in terms of technology development as well as regulatory reform. Uh, and that's a really interesting question. Um, we started working uh, on some policy engagement. Um, so far, the work that we've done has been largely in the UK, although it's now spreading to Europe and, and further afield. Um, we want to be in some of those early conversations uh, in order to help uh, different organisations to develop their approaches uh, appropriately to, to whatever's coming next. So far, some of that has come through uh, training. We've trained some uh, regulators and policymakers as we've gone along. But some of that has also been around uh, taking part and, and hosting workshops to make sure that um, we hear different perspectives, but also share our own uh, expertise. Uh, so that tends to be the way we go. Um, we're also keen to do more of those types of engagement events. So we've had a, a specific question that's just come in around uh, financial trading. Uh, and um, I wonder, John, is it something that you'd like to answer? Uh, the question was around um, whether we're interested and or working in uh, this sphere, and that's around uh, autonomous systems uh, in the finance sector, uh, and why or why we might not. Yeah, yes, thanks, Anna. I mean, so, so far we haven't engaged in that area and we, we might not. I mean, our, our focus has been primarily on, on physical safety and the ethical and other issues that are, arise around that class of system. You know, can autonomy, for example, um, redistribute harm in a way that's unfair or unethical? Um, yeah, I think to be effective, we have to have a, you know, a level of, of expertise. And I think we've built up expertise in that class of, of, of safety over over many decades i think it would be quite difficult for us to develop um similar level of uh, of expertise um in areas like financial trading so I, we will we will likely you know keep to the the areas where we have the level of expertise and um skill to be able to help help the industry and regulators Thank you very much. And uh, that's brought us to the end of the questions that we've had live. But of course, please feel free to contact us with any specific questions or, or queries about what we can do uh, or what we've been working on. We've also uh, launched or rebranded our um, LinkedIn account. So please do have a look at for us there. We're the Center for Assuring Autonomy uh, and we'll be posting updates around the work that we're doing uh, and the events that we'll be hosting uh, on that platform too. Thanks again for joining us and we're excited for the next phase. We hope you'll join us for some of that. <laughs>